Good morning, brothers and sisters. As we return to this week's study from where we left off on Thursday, shall we seek our Heavenly Father's guidance and his blessings so that what we do may be according to his will and so that we may learn the things that we need for this time in earth's history? Shall we now seek him in prayer? Loving Father in heaven, we thank you for this new week. We thank you for this time where we may come before you and study and join together so that we may continue to learn more of you. Guide us now. May your angels be with us. May your spirit open our minds as we seek your blessing for studying and considering properly that which you would have us to understand. Bless those in this meeting. Bless those that will join with this later. Help us now to rightly divide the word of truth. For this, Father, we ask, we pray, and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, we left off at this portion on Thursday. We are finding that Pruitt's published attitude in 2009 was fairly well in line with Uriah Smith. Now, there's several mu- there, there's several more pages of what he would address, and let's take a look at these to see what we are able to determine from what he is presenting. Yeah, so he wouldn't be in line with Uriah Smith regarding the daily, though. No, he is not. No, he's he is if I'm understanding this right, he's more in line with the daily that Prescott, Froome, Ford, and others would have accepted. I wonder if if Eugene Pruitt never really understood the pioneer view of the daily or if he had rejected it. You know, I mean, because many Adventists just had never but they just you know, grew up as Adventists, they always knew of the new view of the day. So, you know, it's possible that he just didn't know at that time. But I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. All right. Well, let's let's continue through some of this and see if we're able to determine an answer to your question. Pruitt makes a statement how sad it is that many persons try to place the 1335-day prophecy with the 1290 into the future. If these time prophecies are in the future, then the book of Daniel is not yet unsealed. Then the Advent movement was founded on an error. Then we are robbed of one of the most simple and direct prophecies of the founding of this great Advent movement. Let it not be. As earlier in the chapter, Daniel was told to go on his way because the book could not yet be understood. So he is told again at the close. So Pruitt's premise again becomes Daniel is told twice to go on his way that the book is to be sealed now I just I I don't know that I'm in full agreement with the way he's approaching this and what follows so let's see what your thoughts are yeah, so so just a couple of points that just to remind us. So we know that he takes the position that the 1335 ends in 1843, not in 1844. Right. And that's one way in which he agrees with Smith. Um, uh, he, in addressing here, he's, he's saying that Daniel removed from his lot. That is the... The, the title of this last section, I'm not sure what he means removed from his lot. And, he, and he's not really saying, I mean, I guess there's an implication, you shall stand in a lot at the end of days, which he doesn't really explain well. Um, but that would be uh, referencing uh, the idea that the book of Daniel will be understood. So, yeah, so I guess he's saying that at the beginning of the chapter, he has said that the book is sealed. And then when he says you can stand in, you, at, you have to wait till the time of the end or at the end when you shall 
set in your lot, and I take it as the time of the end. Um, and it's kind of interesting here. In verse in verse 12 of 13, mine says here in the King James, but go thy way till the end be, for thou shalt rest and stand in thy lot at the end of the days. Is that what ev- is that what everyone says? If, is, okay, so you're talking about Daniel 12, 13, right? Yeah, it says, but go thy way, this is the King James that I have here on my e-sword, to the end be, for thou shalt rest and stand in thy lot at the end of the days, right? Okay. Correct. Okay. Okay. I was just, I've always thought, but go thy way, Daniel. But maybe I'm thinking of, I thought maybe the word Daniel was taken out, but, okay. Yeah, but go thou thy way until the end be. <clears throat> yeah, go thou, but go thou thy way until the end be. Yeah, that's what it says. Okay. Uh, for thou shalt rest and um, settle down. So there's lots of different meanings. Um, lay down, be quiet, etc. For thou shalt rest and stand in thy lot at the end of the days. So we understand that he's going to stand in the lot, but that's when the, the book of Daniel is going to be unsealed. And we understand that standing in his his lot is he's going to receive his destiny. And the lot is the word lot that has to do with um, this piece of property, right, which you receive, which is your allotment, you know, comes by lot, right? So uh, it's using a parallel, as we talked about, with the idea of uh, taking your place, right? Right. Um, just as the Israelites are going to their particular allotments, their lots of of land. So it's just it's just it's an idiom, I guess, for just your purpose will be fulfilled at the end of the days. But uh, I never considered about this word rest because he's going to rest at the end of the days. And so the idea here of him resting it, it's because we know that this is really about the message, the book of Daniel not Daniel personally, he's not going to, uh, you know, rest in 1798. Now, right. <clears throat> That's not the idea. And it's not saying that um, uh, that you're going to die and that you're going to be in the grave, though he is going to die and be in the grave, but it's not addressing that. It's not addressing, about, addressing him dying. So I, I, at least I don't take it that the rest is referring to a rest in death. I don't see any indication of that. So I'm not, not pretty, really sure how to deal with that rest there. But anyway, is Pruitt going to address any of this standing in his lot at this point? Yes. Okay. So let's see what he says. So. Of course, he quotes Daniel 12, 13. His statement then is Daniel has been standing in his position, standing in his portion as a teacher since 1798, the end of the 1290 days, and in his position as being judged by the books since 1844, the end of the 2300 days. Though resting from his labors, his book has been opened. His life work has been the lifeblood of a blessed movement. And that is the message of Revelation 10 and 14, the subjects of some other Bible study some other time. Now, here, Pruitt chooses to quote from Seventh-day Adventist Bible Commentary, Volume 7, page 949. Again, I have my problems with this type of a a work, and I like to go to the source document. So, yeah, to the original uh, letter or wherever that uh, LMI quote came from. Now, this has both a non-published from 1900 and a portion from the Crest Collection, but to read part of this in context would say, The enemy's last great conflict will be a most determined one. 
It will be the last battle between the powers of darkness and the powers of light. Every true child of God will fight bravely on the side of Christ. Those who in this crisis allow themselves to be more on the side of the world than of God will eventually place themselves wholly on the side of the world. Now, that's that's quite a powerful statement. The next paragraph, which is the one that that uh, Prude is quoting, those who become confused in their understanding of the word, who fail to see the meaning of Antichrist, will surely place themselves on the side of Antichrist. There is no time now for us to assimilate with the world. Daniel is standing in his lot and in his place. Now, Mrs. White there is using current verbiage, is standing in his lot and in his place. The prophecies of Daniel and of John are to be understood. They interpret one another. They give to the world truths which everyone should understand. These prophecies are to be witnesses in the world. By their fulfillment in these last days, they will explain themselves. The following paragraph is also most necessary. The Lord is about to punish the world for its iniquity. He is about to punish religious bodies for their rejection of the light and truth which has been given them. The great message combining the first, second, and third angel's messages is to be given to the world. This is to be the burden of our work. Those who truly believe in Christ will openly conform to the law of Jehovah. The Sabbath is the sign between God and his people, and we are to make visible our conformity to the law of God by observing the Sabbath. It is to be the mark of distinction between God's chosen people and the world. Now, returning to Pruitt's paper, Blessed is he that waiteth and cometh to the thousand three hundred five and thirty days. But go thou thy way till the end be, for thou shalt rest and stand in thy lot at the end of days. Daniel has been standing in his lot since the seal was removed, and the light of truth has been shining upon his visions. He stands in his lot, bearing the testimony, which was to be understood at the end of days. Now, if we were... What was that that other reference that uh, Seventh-day Adventist Bible commentary was from? Manuscript 10, 1900. Thanks. But we we have it there... It is also available in the Cress Collection, page 105.2. So when I look at this, I am interested because this portion from Sermons and Talks was also from Manuscript 50 of 1893, which was given in September of 1893. So this was a sermon given shortly within five years after the 1888 message. So Mrs. White is stating that the seal that was placed on Daniel 1140 to 45 was removed by that time. So Pruitt continues, a careful consideration of the latter of these two statements by Ellen White will show that she placed the end of days of the 1290 and the 1335 in her past. Well, if she says in 1900 that Daniel is standing in his lot, that's seven years after she makes the comment that Daniel has been standing in his lot since the seal was removed. Pruitt continues, that was sensible. Yes. So, yeah, so Daniel stands in his lot at the end of the day, so that's the end of the 1290. Right. Um, and he does stand in his lot through that period to the end of the 1335. 
but he's still standing in his lot. Right. So, so Pruitt's just saying that both these periods are in the past. People who try to put them into the future, obviously, Ellen White has marked them as being in the past. And so all of these people who try to put these into the future, obviously, don't accept the spirit of prophecy statement that they've already been fulfilled. So Pruitt states, that was sensible. It still is, even if it isn't the leading argument in interpreting this message. As Daniel stands teaching on earth and stands in judgment in heaven, so do we. Our message should be like his, that our judgment may be like his also. So Pruitt continues. Just this morning, while editing this book, I received yet another emailed study that suggests that these prophecies are literal time periods in the future. Eventually, I concluded, though I never verified this conclusion, that the study was authored by someone who had read a book entitled Daniel, written by a popular Adventist evangelist. While visiting ASI in Phoenix, I purchased a copy of the man's book. I had heard that it presented futuristic interpretations of Daniel 12, but I had never verified it for myself. On page 155 of the book is a chart of a most disturbing nature. It shows three time periods of Daniel 12, the 1260, 1290, and 1335 periods, as each beginning at the setting up of the National Sunday Law Abomination of Desolation. According to the chart, three and a half years later will bring us to the close of human probation. And one month after that, the death sentence will be decreed upon us. Then, just over six weeks later, Jesus will return. Now, if this is a book that's being sold in 2009 at ASI meetings, it is a book that would have been, at least had some approval, at least from the conference that this was being sold at, if not from the general conference. Um, not necessarily. Okay. Um, know more about ASI. So there's a lot of uh, independent ministries. So this could be, I, I, I kind of wish he would tell us whose book it is. Um, but yeah, it doesn't mean it's a regular denominational book. Okay. Uh, ASI has lots, sells lots of things that are just independent ministries. Okay. Thank you for that. One great irony of the book is that it repeatedly speaks of 1798 as the time of the end. It correctly teaches that the book of Daniel was unsealed at that time. But I will try to ask the brother how he arrives at this date for the time of the end. Why would I ask this question? Because Adventists got this idea from Daniel 12. It was our understanding of the 1260-day prophecy as leading up to the end that led us to our conclusion. This is an important point. The placing of Daniel 12, 1260 into the future removes all scriptural basis for associating the date 1798 with the phrase time of the end. And as Ellen White makes it clear that our pioneers were correct in saying that Daniel was unsealed at that time, we would be amiss to say that she doesn't weigh in on the question, is the 1260 days of Daniel in the future? But there is more. As one of his primary arguments, the evangelist discusses the various words Daniel uses for time prophecies in the book of Daniel. He reasons that since the Hebrew word for day is used only literally in Daniel 1 through 10, we ought to understand it literally in Daniel 12. Ironically, on page 88 of the same book, the author correctly explains that God has given a rule in Bible prophecy that a day represents one year. Then as evidence, he refers to Numbers 14.34 and Ezekiel 4.6. Here is the irony. These two passages use the very same word for day, as does Daniel 12. Aside, however... From these two inconsistencies between the good material in most of the book and that troubling chapter at the end, there's a larger issue. 
How do we relate to the plain statements of inspiration? Now, the point here is one that we will address and we will be discussing in our studies in the near future. Friday evening, I was having a conversation with another brother. This brother has been having a lot of consternation regarding the point that Mrs. White made when she endorses Uriah Smith's book, Thoughts on Daniel and Revelation, calling it God's Helping Hand, especially given Smith's position regarding Daniel 11.36. So Pruitt comes up with his plain statements regarding inspiration. Now, here he looks to quote from a current published book, Last Day Events, stating our position has been one of waiting and watching with no time proclamation to intervene between the close of the prophetic periods in 1844 and the time of our Lord's coming. Last Day Events, page 36. Now, he then continues, Should we advance in spiritual knowledge, we would see the truth developing and, and expanding in lines of which we have little dreamed, but it will never develop in any line that will lead us to imagine that we may know the times and the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power. Again and again have I warned, have I been warned in regard to time setting. There will never again be a message for the people of God that will be based on time. We are not to know the definite time either for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit or for the coming of Christ. Now, Ellen White, because I did a, a study on this back in 2018. And uh, so when we, we brought time setting into the movement, I took the position that we cannot contradict these plain statements in the spirit of prophecy. And so the question was, how, do we, how come we're talking about dates in the future? If Ellen White says that we are never going to um, six years ago today, no, when, well, six years ago today is when we uh, first presented um, time. That's Parminder. That's going to be on on his is going to be on June 9th. So it's going to be at in the sunset when Jeff closes because uh, Iran asked this question uh, closes with prayer at 9-11, one year after he did in um, on June 2nd in Italy, so these two Italys. Um, so it wasn't on that day because uh, I didn't know that where the movement was doing time setting until uh, August um, August um, 6th to 11th, I think is uh, the time our camp meeting was. That Anyway, so um so getting back to what was i saying <laughs> yeah so i had i had addressed this time setting and and i said that we we have to accept what ellen white says we can't contradict it but that the time setting that was happening in the movement was had to do with the movement itself that we weren't addressing because ellen white talks about she says we can't know the time for you know, any of these things, the close of probation, um, you know, that we were talking about the close of probation being November 9th, 2019. I said, well, obviously that can't be the close of probation because Ellen White says we can't know the time for it. So, so that was one of my arguments that it can't be the close of probation. But we had set up with this time setting because of Parminder, and, and even back then before Parminder, you know, exposed himself. I said because of the time setting he had done in 2012, that he had set in motion, um, that time was now to be addressed in our movement in, in a parallel with uh, time in Millerite history. And, and if you think about it, well, if that's the case, then we would have to have a disappointment as well. 
just as the Millerites did, which we did have. So people would say, well, you know, you guys were time setting. You obviously ignored what Ellen White said about time setting. But I took it that the time setting was set up by Parminder, which was in, incorrect. I mean, the Sunday law didn't come in 2014. But in 2017, Parminder was reaffirming that he was correct in his calculation, but not correct as to the event. And so I, I think it's something that we have to really think about when it comes to this time setting that, that's in the movement. I mean, because we're going to accept what Ellen White says about time setting. Uh, but people are still time setting in the movement. And there's different t ways in which you can time set, because he's addressing time setting here, just with the idea of them saying, from the Sunday law, then we're going to have this much time. And he would take that as time setting. And, and I would agree. Well, in this in this position, when Pruitt chose to take a, a, a brief snippet from last day events, I again find it interesting that when we refer to the source document, that we might find things written just a little differently. Now, especially trying to understand what the watching and waiting is. Agreed. Right, that's the one that's watching and waiting. Yeah. Well, this one from last day events. I'm going to read the paragraph that precedes this sentence, and then I'm going to read the paragraph that includes this sentence. The time setters have pronounced the curse of the Lord upon me as an unbeliever who said, my Lord delayeth his coming. But I have told them that the books of heaven would not make my record thus. For the Lord knows that I loved and longed for the appearing of Christ. But their oft-repeated message of definite time was exactly what the enemy wanted. And it served his purpose well to unsettle the faith in the first proclamation of time that was of heavenly origin. The world placed all time proclamation on the same level and called it a delusion, fanaticism, and heresy. Ever since 1844, I have borne my testimony that we were now in a period of time in which we are to take heed to ourselves, lest our hearts be overcharged with surfeiting and drunkenness and the cares of this life, and so that that day come upon us unawares. Our position has been one of waiting and watching with no time proclamation to intervene between the close of the prophetic periods in 1844 and the time of our Lord's coming. We do not know the day nor the hour or when the definite time is, and yet the prophetic reckoning shows us that Christ is at the door. Now, does that come across a little bit differently to you than the statement that Pruitt is, is quoting from last day events. Yeah, now, well, there's more context there. And now, so one of the things, uh, so where was that, that, where's the statement from? Is that in last day events that has that, or is there another source? The source document is letter 38, 1888, oh. paragraph 16. Okay. Now, she had one paragraph that followed this. There's actually several, but the next one is, is kind of kind of pointed. We have not cast away our confidence. Neither have we a message dependent upon definite time. But we are waiting and okay. watching. What, what, uh, excuse me. What, what letter was it? Letter, letter 38. 38. Okay, sorry. 1888. August 11th, 1888. Yes. Of course, no symbols there, right? Yeah. We have not cast away our confidence. Neither have we a message dependent upon definite time. But we are waiting and watching under prayer, looking for and loving the appearing of our Savior, and doing it all in our power for the preparation of our fellow men for that great event. We are not impatient. If the vision tarry, wait for it, for it will surely come. It will not tarry. 
though disappointed, our faith has not failed. And we have not drawn back to perdition. The apparent tarrying is not so in reality. For at the appointed time, our Lord will come. And we will, if faithful, exclaim, Lo, this is our God. We have waited for him. And he will save us. Isaiah 25, 9. So here, again, is she not quoting from Habakkuk? as well as Isaiah, is she not stating to us that even if the prophecy given her regarding Nashville does not occur, that we are still to wait knowing that this is going to occur? Yes. So in reading this whole section, because... uh, Now, what is the reason that she's giving for why she is addressing time setting in this letter? So she gets this, you know, she says, yeah, I received your letter this morning. We'll reply briefly. We have no recollection of receiving the letter of the character you mentioned. We'll look through my writings when I have more time. Right. I'm just reading through this here. Did you read through it mostly? Go to which paragraph? Go to paragraph 13. Okay, for some reason this doesn't number the paragraphs. Uh, what's the, the first sentence in paragraph 13? I have been repeatedly. Okay, I've been repeatedly urged to accept the different periods of time proclaimed for the Lord to come. So all these different time setting things that she's addressing. But even before that, she talks about, uh, um, about the suppression of the writings. Right. Um, that supposed suppression of the writings, the charge. And then she says, I was a firm believer in definite time in 1844, but this prophetic time was not shown me in vision for some months, weeks after the passing of this period of time before the first vision was given me. Um, So a lot of people accused her of, you know, failing in the time prediction of 1844. You see this a lot in anti-Adventist literature, as if Ellen White was, you know, envisioned saw that Jesus was coming back in 1844. And there were many proclaiming a new time after this, but I was shown that we should not have another definite time to proclaim to the people. Um, And we know that, uh, I mean, there was different people who were expecting Christ to come at different times, but Ellen White had no light in regard to any of those time settings. And the time setting in 1851, she definitely opposed. Right in early writings, page 74, we see that So in her vision of October 23, 1850. But then in this paragraph before that, so paragraph, paragraph 12, I've been shown that our disappointment in 1844 was not because of failure in the reckoning of prophetic periods, but in the events to take place. The earth was believed to be the sanctuary. The sanctuary, which was to be cleansed at the end of the prophetic periods, was the heavenly sanctuary and not the earth, as we suppose. The Savior did enter the most holy place in 1844 to cleanse the sanctuary, and the investigative judgment had commenced for the dead. So in our history, our parallel to 18, October 22nd, 1844, is July 18th. So I took the position that we didn't fail in the time that we chose but in the event that was to occur. It's not that we had the right event, but the wrong date. I mean, obviously, there is the event of Nashville that will happen, and we did not have the date for that. But we were correct in proclaiming July 18, 2020, in the context of what was happening within the movement. That is, Parminder had started it, you know, in the sense he had set in motion Uh, time setting. It was rejected by Jeff as fanaticism in 2012. After 2014, Arminder uh, was his way back into Jeff's good books. In 2017, they had, we had now accepted that, that Parminder was correct in his calculation, uh, but was wrong as to what was going to happen in 2014. And then in 2018, six years ago today, um, 
now because now here for me personally it is june 6th or june 10th pardon me uh, i know for you guys it's still june 9th but uh you know arminda is going to present um uh in in italy he's going to be presenting this uh that we are going to be setting a date now that date's going to be november 9th 2019 which parminder already knew at the time so he knew that they already had that november 9th 2019 date uh, but he didn't reveal it right tess is going to reveal that on october 3rd 2018 um, and then 10 days later it's going to be confirmed uh, by a different method with accounting 391 and a half days from October 13th, the start of the, uh, November 9th, 2019. And that's going to then set in motion all of this information uh, regarding that we had had previously regarding Josiah Lich's prophecy and Ezekiel that will come together to uh, give us July 18, 2020. That's going to be rejected by Parminder and Tess. So they never support July 18, 2020. And so, uh, so July 18, 2020 stands as a witness against Parminder and Tess. So it was something internal within the movement. And, and you know, so people just think, well, we, that we set time then, we can continue setting time. But my view is that we don't set time. Now we did because we already had the 777 day period. We knew that that uh, December 25th, 2021 uh, was the end of that period, and 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 that end was marked by uh, basically three events, three things. Uh, Stephen recognized in the 777 years from 457 to 321 when the first Sunday law occurs. And then you're going to have uh, Colin presenting his Trump prediction, which again is going to be a test for the message, or a test, a testing message for the movement, um, but not in the way that Colin thinks. And then uh, we're also going to have that um, invitation that is made in, in uh, to come together on that date. December 25th, 2021, and have a study, and, and the American and Canadian groups reject any joint effort. So it becomes a separation in the movement at that time as well. It's going to grow and manifest more as time goes on, but that's what happens then. So, so God has given us time within this movement, but that doesn't mean that we believe in time setting, right? I hope people agree with me that we, we do not believe in time setting, but we still see people time setting in various ways. And what Eugene Pruitt shows is time setting. Um, that would be time setting as well. So if right. we say from such a such date, something's going to happen further on. It's still time setting, even if we're not, um, you know, starting, you know, in with prophetic lines earlier on. So we can't predict what's going to happen now watching and waiting i believe includes recognizing symbolic dates so that when events pass we can see a structure as events unfold and that's completely consistent with watching and waiting and with ellen white's counsel against time setting and even if i have a date in the future that's a symbolic date that's not time setting unless I attach to that symbolic date in the future some prediction regarding what's going to happen on that date. Now, I don't know if everybody agrees with me on that, but that was my position even back, you know, in uh, 2020 after July 18th, that I didn't believe that we could predict anything for March 27th, uh, 2021, or December 25th, 2021. Didn't mean any nothing wouldn't happen on those dates, but just because we have a date doesn't mean something has to happen of significance. A date can still just be a symbolic date as part of a structure, even without an event on it. And we see this from Josiah Lich's prophecy in the 150 uh, days, the, or 150 years, the five months, 
we don't have an event in 1449. We have a date, July 27th, or the 26th day of the fourth month on July 18th, whichever one you use. And then we just count from there. Right? So you're going to count from uh, July 27th, uh, Julian, or July 18th, but pardon me, the other way around, July 27th, Gregorian, or July 18th, Julian, which both are the 26th day of the fourth month. You're going to count the 391 years um, and 15 days from, from that. But there is no event in 1449. So, so we know that dates uh, can be symbols without events, but we know we can't predict any events in the future as to their time. And, and even a span of time, we can't say, you know, it's going to happen, uh, you know, this year. And we can say, well, that's not time setting because, you know, I didn't give a specific date. But this year is a date. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> Through it continues stating that this last statement addresses the oft abused truth regarding new light. Should we expect new light? The spirit affirms yes. Is that an open season for each and every new idea to be given a full hearing? The spirit denies it is so. So he's saying yes, that at least the way I'm reading this, that we should expect new light, but that we should not be give be allowing a full hearing on the new light as it comes to pass. Would you agree with what I'm stating? No. Okay. You have to give everything a full hearing because otherwise you have no way of assessing whether it's new light or not. Right. Um, yeah. Now, now, you could say, you know, if something says it's new light and, um, you know, if it has time attached to it, that means we don't, we don't listen to it at all. I, I'm not, you know, sometimes you have to listen to things carefully before you understand what they are. Right. right. So, you know, so somebody may have said, you know, I'm not going to listen to this July 18th thing because, you know, it's predicting a date in the future. But out of context, it appeared we were time setting. And, and I believe that actually people in the movement were time setting. But I would say I personally was not time setting in contravention of Alan White's counsel because I understood the context of what was happening. This was not something that was on Ellen White's line. This was something internal within the movement. So that's why, and because it was witnessed to in so many different ways, based on what I was doing, and then I realized as time went on that it was a witness against Parminder and his movement, then I could see the value in it. Even though by that time, I also saw that our prediction itself may fail, just as Parminder's did, and just as the Protestants did, September 23rd, 2017, and just as the New Age people or whatever they were that you thought the Mayan calendar would bring the end of the world. All of these groups and, and our group all had a failed prediction. And um, so that clearly showed that we can't predict events in the future the timing of them. But we can watch and wait. And, and so we do also need to hear anything that, that claims to be new light. Uh, we need to give it a, a fair hearing. Now, maybe a full hearing? Well, I don't know how you could assess something, whether it's true or not, without a full hearing, right? It's like if you, if you heard of the 2520 and it's a number and you think it's time setting, so you're not going to give it a full hearing, or you hear somebody saying, um, well, Leviticus 26 is not uh, a time prophecy or it's not a prophecy, um, so you're not going to listen to it. Well, then you're going to miss out on new light. The, 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 the thing that we are to do is to decide whether anything that says to be new light, does it contradict old light? If it does, after we give it a full hearing, then we would have to reject it as false light, right? Oh, Dwight disappeared. Okay. Any other thoughts about this? Anyone else? Joining the conversation a little, a little late, but uh, um, 
seems to, sure seems to fit with what I was reading there from early writings on Friday. Uh, yeah. About, what was it? Okay. Some persons have noted that Daniel 12 is couched in literal words. Therefore, they have claimed that the prophecies in it must be literal prophecies. But this is faulty. In Daniel 7, the time prophecy is found not in the symbolic section of the chapter, but in the section that is explaining the symbols. Now, my question for us to consider is there such a thing as a literal prophecy? Um, Go ahead. I mean, a prophecy that's in literal language in the Bible. I mean, th there's always aspects of prophecies that are literal, and there's always aspects that are symbolic. I, I don't know of any time prophecy that's only symbolic or only literal. Well, here again. In giving a, a, a brief reference to Smith's portion on Daniel 11:36, he makes the claim that that is that verse is a literal prophecy. Now I agree that prophecies will be literally fulfilled. Right. But I struggle with the idea of literal prophecies. Yeah, me, me too. So, I mean, prophecies are always written in symbolic language. And you can say that, you know, Daniel chapter 11 is more literal than Daniel chapter 8, right? It's right. going to talk about kings and so forth. It's not going to be talking about feasts, right? Or if you're dealing with Daniel chapter 2, it's not going to be a, a symbolic representation like an image. But there's all kinds of symbols being employed. And Hebrew itself is a symbolic language, much more than many other languages. All languages kind of have symbols to them. But, but Hebrew uses lots of figures, lots of uh, symbolic figures. Um, and, and so it's a language that can hold a lot of information. That's the nice thing about a symbol, is it can hold information more than just direct language. And, and Hebrew also has, has symbols within uh, the words themselves, because even the letters themselves represent things, and that's part of the meaning attached to the word, which shows that Hebrew is a designed language, not a developed language. Of course, it has developed over time, but it started as a designed language, you know, such as the mem in in a word. Uh, the letter mem represents water, and, and so so you're going to see that uh, you know the words that relate to water are going to have a mem in them. So so Hebrew has that. Plus, Hebrew also has uh, the idea of gematria is is part of Hebrew. The idea that, you know, words or sentences add up to a certain number and those numbers are symbolic. So there's so many levels in which the, the Bible contains symbols. But the argument that Pruitt's using, or, or that this person is using that Pruitt's referring to, that the idea, because it's the day in Daniel is used literally, then it means it must always be interpreted literally. Well, it depends, because I think... Uh, the ones where it's used literally, it's actually just in the stories. Um, but we're not dealing with a story here, right? Um, and he didn't seem to address that point. He could have looked at each use of the word day. And those were in the narratives, right? Right. I, I don't see that there's a day being used in Daniel anywhere that we would take literally. I can't think of any offhand except in the narratives, in the symbolic prophecies. Okay. But he doesn't address that, which he should have, I think. But anyway, that's just me. Now, he closes this section in stating, the time prophecies in Daniel 12 are likewise found in the explanatory section of Daniel 11 to 12 prophecy, and the daily and the 
abomination of Daniel 12 are in fact symbols. He gives a footnote to this. Some persons reading this book will begin by searching to see what view it takes of the daily. While this chapter alludes to my view on this prophetic hot potato, a fuller explanation is found at my website, www.bibledoc.org, under class materials. I did not want this book to be defined by its position on the daily and so omitted the fuller presentation. Of course, one cannot discuss the 1290 and the 1335 without involving the daily to some degree. Now, that answers our question. So he does know about the daily, but he's he's uh, intentionally being obtuse. Now, I find it interesting. This book, of course, was published in 2009. I am on his website. It is currently restructured, and I'm looking at what he has placed here. He did a presentation regarding Daniel 8 and the Daily on 24th of July of 2013. Now, I've not gone into this yet. I may go into it and then have this ready for tomorrow. Yeah, I just don't see how you can avoid uh, dealing with the daily and the abomination of desolation as the two desolating powers and even address the taking away of the daily and the setting up the abomination of desolation connected to the 1290 and the 1335. I don't see how you could do a study on it without doing that. So trying to avoid uh, this controversy here doesn't really make much sense. Because um, if, if I was him, this is just me. I was him. Uh, I would have. I would have made it clear why we need to understand the correct view of the daily. He may be taking a position that's not really an important issue. I don't know. Okay. Okay. I'm. I'm looking at a statement that he makes here, and again, I will. I'll, well, I'll look to do what I can to copy this so that we can examine this further together. But his statement says the issue over the daily became eventually an issue over hermeneutics and over the relation of Ellen White to biblical exposition. Prescott and followers felt that the early writing statement did not settle the issue. Haskell, Smith and followers felt it did settle the issue. On this last question, Ellen White eventually sided with Prescott's camp. Prescott was a proponent of the new view. So I'm... Okay, so that tells us that he's wrong. Yes. So, yeah. So Ellen White does not... Uh, I don't know how he gets the idea that she sides with his camp. Now, I do think, though, that there was... The problem that Ellen White points out is that they, they were trying to settle it by one of her statements rather than studying it together. That's my understanding I get from reading that history. Right. Um, but she never uh, comes down on the side of the new view. And she's quite clear that the new view is a satanic origin. But she doesn't believe that her statements should settle that. She believes that it should be settled by a study of God's word because it, it, it's going to weaken uh, be weakened if we just take a statement like early writing 74 and think that that settles the matter because there was new light to come from an understanding of the daily. Even though the pioneers were united on the correct view of the daily in regard to that the daily is paganism, there was still lots of light to come in regard to how that related to Daniel's prophecies, right? So we don't just say, well, Miller was right about the daily. Um, because there is obviously an understanding of the abomination of desolation in that we, we need to understand in the context of the heavenly sanctuary that, you know, pa papalism is a counterfeit of the heavenly sanctuary. And so we, we need to understand that and how it all fits into 
the 2300 days and the cleansing of the sanctuary and all the prophetic periods, all the light that we have had in this movement that obviously wasn't understood uh, by the pioneers prior to October 22nd, 1844. So that's the way that I understand Ellen White's statement uh, or statements regarding the daily, you know, that uh, we shouldn't, one is we shouldn't make it a public issue because we're not in agreement on it, but also we need to study it um, and not settle it with um, in the manner that they were trying to do that. And I would say that that applies to something like the 2520, because if you look at how people try to uh, deal with the 2520, they would just try to take a few statements. They had in their mind an imagination of what the 2520 was, and, and they only have a Millerite understanding of the 2520. And so they just say, nobody can, uh, you know, it's not a prophetic period because James White said it wasn't, even though that's uh, Uriah Smith. And, um, and that sort of settled the matter for them. They didn't give it a full hearing. They didn't understand that just as with the daily, there was light that would come that would clarify that we did have the correct view of the daily, but we didn't understand it fully. We did have the correct understanding of the 2520, but we didn't understand it fully. We didn't have both 2520s. We didn't understand the four seven times, their fulfillment in for literal Israel in that history, in that 220 years, right? So new light comes, but new light always establishes old light. It agrees with it. And definitely the new light of the new view of the daily is not new light because it rejects old light. And we see, we see the fruit of it. We can see that much more clearly now. And Ella White understood the danger of it, but she also understood the danger of people just taking her early writing statement and not receiving new light. Right. So, through it continued, Daniel 12, 4 to 12 is a prophecy of the Middle Age rise and fall of the papacy and the Advent movement that followed. It is true that there will be another bout of persecution there will be another gathering of the remnant. But Ellen White's comparison of the Sunday law to the destruction of Jerusalem is no reason to find in every prophecy of an abomination that desolates a prophecy of a Sunday law. This idea is further developed in the next chapter of this book. Now think this through. Why do we think that if someone has done a lot of research and collected a lot of reasons that seem sweet and nice, that they must be right. Have we forgotten how difficult it was for our pioneers to come together in thought? And our logic and study and prayerfulness and experience in digging truth out of scripture pales next to theirs. In the view of that, it should not offend one of us to be accused of being very wrong in our conclusions. Better men than we were indeed very wrong 160 years ago. May we grow brighter in our research. Now, I'm, I've scanned through part of what he is presenting on Daniel 8 and the daily. And I just, I, I don't know exactly how to take much of what, what he's trying to say here. He did have a comment from someone that had read this in 2014 where it was stated, I had a hard time following your thoughts here. Seemed rather disjointed. What is the daily then? You never really state it clearly. This person is very direct and very very pointed in coming back to Pruitt. Pruitt's response was, I am sorry my thoughts weren't clear to you. I might be able to edit the paper in a few months. This is what I think. Number one. The daily is not a critical issue. Number two, the daily is nothing in particular. Now, as I've looked, as I have considered, and as we have all studied, the position that I would look at in agreement with Edson is that the daily is 1,260 years of paganism and the abomination which makes 
maketh desolate is 1260 years of papalism. In, in, other, in other words, one period of 2,520 years. So nothing in particular was taken away in order to set up the abomination of desolation? That seems to be what Pruitt is saying. Hmm. Quite interesting. So he doesn't have it as Christ's heavenly ministry or as pa paganism, but it's just nothing in particular. Right. Okay. That's, that's what he said to this one party that responded. Yeah. yeah I'm not sure what he means. I mean, this is a pretty problematic uh, section here, his uh, conclusion or whatever he wants to call it. Yeah. Does here, here I, I, I don't know. Go ahead. What's that? Said, yeah, I just don't know how he could say the things that he's saying. And, 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 and so when he talks about, you know, you know, somebody puts together a lot of research, uh, basically this is sort of a, a very condescending thing to say. And, and I would say quite arrogant, actually, because what it does is it dismisses somebody who has done a lot of work. And, and, and I don't think just because some, somebody's done a lot of work that that means that they're right. Obviously not. But it, it, it can be quite dismissive of some, somebody comes along and has done a lot. I don't need to look at, at it because, you know, the pioneers are a lot smarter. I mean, he doesn't feel that he needs to examine things that he doesn't need to examine things that people bring to him, that he doesn't agree with, that, that are new light, that people claim are new light. He doesn't need to examine it. And, and he can just brush it off. And, and I find that even when people draw wrong conclusions, I actually value research that people do. Uh, one is sometimes they notice details uh, that are quite important. They may not have uh, place them in their proper context and have draw the truth and have a correct conclusion about it. Maybe sometimes they don't have a good attitude because of people never listening to them, like Eugene Pruitt. Uh, so maybe they lack some character in their their ability to express themselves. They get take things personally and so forth. But I don't think that I would ever just dismiss somebody who's done a lot of work. And I've spent a lot of time reading people's material and discussing with them who, who have done a lot of research and are wrong in some points. Uh, but one is also I'm trying to win them, right? So I spend time talking with them and trying to understand the position. You can see some of it in uh, the comments on the YouTube videos where people are you know, presenting ideas and then I'm asking questions and trying to create a dialogue. Some people you can't uh, create a dialogue with. They just post all kinds of comments. They don't read anything I write. Uh, sometimes there are people that have a dialogue. So um, Eugene Pruitt is taking this position. Basically, I'm really not interested in what anybody else has to say. That's the way I would take him. That's in a, in a very succinct manner of presenting pretty much where I'm looking at this from what Pruitt is stating. Now, his position in calling the daily a hot button and then not really wanting to delve into it in a simple manner is doing a bit of harm. At least the first thing is... If he believes it to be that Ellen White has taken the view, he should be able to support it. And he should be able to, to uh, field opposition and address the points that other people make. Right. Right. So, I mean, if, if you can't defend a position and you don't want to hear what anyone has to say about it, uh, it's not a very safe place to be. Exactly. Now, the next chapter that he uses here, he wants to tie other points into this. So I'm going to bring us to the, the forefront of this chapter. 
Okay, so he's going to address the, the 25, 20 year prophecy. Right. So I have read this uh, section before. Okay. Right. So I know this story because this is one of the things when I first came into this movement in 2010, and he wrote this in 2009. Right. Right. So this is what I first read. I did. I did listen to you know started listening to some of his uh, sermons at that time. You know, there weren't videos, but sermons online. And but I thought he was generally fairly good, a conservative Adventist. Right. But like everyone else with the 2520, he's going to devolve into that type of argument that he's sort of um, criticizing that was happening regarding the daily. That is, he's going to argue uh, in a way that is not not really understanding what is being taught. Now, of course, back in 2009, we're, we're pretty new into our understanding of the 2520, right? He's not, I don't think he addresses, um, uh, you know, the prophetic mirror in any kind of detail, if I remember it correctly. He more is going to argue over, you know, the intensity of those types of things. but. Uh, I mean, we could go through this article. It'd probably be helpful. Uh, right now, in my my writing out of this uh, Daniel's last vision, so I started at chapter ten, started working through. One thing I do do at the beginning of uh, the book, I guess, or whatever it is, the paper, is I am actually addressing a bit more in detail uh, the twenty five twenty because I don't think you can actually understand it, uh, Daniel chapter twelve, for sure without understanding the 2520. And I believe the whole reason that the last vision is given is for Daniel to understand the chazon, the 2520, the whole prophetic mirror, the whole picture. Um, so, so it'd probably be profitable to go through this, even if it's gonna be a little bit painful. Okay, through it begins. I have on, my, on the wall in my study a facsimile of one of the more prominent Millerite charts. For more than 15 years, I have been interested in this chart and particularly in the more obscure portions of it. I might have been ab about to leave my teen years when I first realized that Millers and others taught about a time period that was 2,520 years long. This chapter will survey the early Adventist teaching on the 2520 year prophecy and will then offer for several biblical observations to those interested in understanding what the Bible teaches in regards to the 2520. For those who are not familiar with the facts of this case, Miller believed that there were two 1260-year periods that together made a 2,520-year period. Obviously, he doesn't quite understand what Miller taught. Exactly. One of these 1260-year periods is familiar to Adventists. It began in 538 and ended in 1798. It was the period of papal civil supremacy mentioned earlier in the chapters on the mark of the beast and the last 12 verses of Daniel 12. The other is less familiar. It is what Miller believed to be the times of the Gentiles, Luke 21:24. He understood this to be the first of the two 1260-year periods brought to view in Revelation 11. And he thought this to be the one pictured in Daniel 12. So he does kind of get this right. I mean, there is two 1260-year periods, but Miller is going to break them up, and he's going to show how they're broken up. Right. So, But I don't think... Um, uh, I don't think I would have characterized it that way, but um, Miller never really talks about two 1260-year periods in that way. Um, and, and does he call them the times of the Gentiles? I don't have an answer for that. I, I don't think he does. I just think Kyra Metzen used that. So is it possible, I, I he, that. Is it possible that he is conflating Edson's and Miller's views? 
it's possible. It's possible he doesn't fully understand them. But he is going to break up Miller's in um, to the 215 years and the 45 years. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm going to take a look and see if I can find that term times of the Gentiles in Miller's writings. Okay. Now, going into the rest of this, he states, for the timing of this first 1260-year period, he took 677 B.C. as the beginning of the Jewish captivity under Assyrian Babylon and brought this forward 1,215 years to 538 A.D. Then he added 45 years of non-Catholic Roman control of Jerusalem to 1798 and came to 1843. One of the most interesting features of this period, as Miller understood it, was that it coincided with the Jubilee release when, and with the 6,000th year of the Earth's existence. Now, is that the way we've come to understand what Miller understood? So, um, yeah, so there's the Jubilee re release with the 6,000 years of Earth's existence. So we had the 6,000 years ending in 1843, and he had the, the creation of the world. He added 153 years to Usher's date. So he started on um, uh, 4,157 BC for the creation. Okay. So yeah, so uh, the Jubilee release, um, though he, um, I mean, he connected, of course, the 2300 days and the 2520 uh, to the Jubilee, and, and the 6,000 years would end there as well. Okay. Now, he does footnote that in August of 1844, the Signs of the Times printed an article by Samuel Snow showing the period extended to 1844. His second footnote, he differed from Usher on this point arguing that Usher and others missed about 150 years during the times of the judges. Now, um, as I think he's, I, I'm just being really picky here. Um, so we know that uh, there is an article, The True Midnight Cry, that's published in 1844. Right. It's not the signs of the times that's in August 22nd, 1844. It's going to be published in the signs on April 3rd, 1844, that the period extended to 1844. Okay. So what's published in August is actually not in the signs of the times. There is an article published in the signs of the times, but that's not uh, the one that's addressing uh, October 22nd, 1844. So his... The, the reference here with Signs of the Times is a bit poor. Would you say so? Yeah, I think there is going to be one in October uh, where he, they're going to republish the True Midnight Cry in October. I'm not sure right. if it's in the Signs of the Times, but, but in August it's just going to be an independent uh, publication. But there is, uh, there is another... Um, article that's published at that time as well in the signs but it's just not the one that people think i, I got confused about it too in the past so uh, you know it's so it's just something i noticed later on okay miller opposed on solid grounds those persons who looked for a rebuilt jerusalem as a fulfillment of covenant promises he argued that christ coming to reign on the throne of david would be the event of the Jubilee that would free the Jews from their 2,520 years of bondage under a succession of five great world empires. Thus, he taught the Jews would be freed from bondage at Christ's return after more than two millennia under bondage to other nations. James White later quoted the Advent Shield, an early Millerite paper, to show that Sabbath-keeping Adventists were justified in holding to the original Millerite dates, while other Adventists were setting new and untried dates. The paragraphs that he quoted from the Advent Shield included a passing reference to the 2520 and the Great Jubilee, 
the 2,450 year prophecy alluded to above 49 by 50 years, showing that both terminated in 1844. These same paragraphs from the early Advent Shield were quoted by Seventh-day Adventists no less than seven times, three during the first year of publication of the Sabbath Herald, two during the first year publication of the Review and Herald, and two during the tenth year of the Review and Herald. The seven-year prophetic period of Jewish captivity that Miller found in several Bible passages, he found it in Leviticus 26. He found it also in Deuteronomy 15, figured under the seven-year release, the sabbatical year. He found it also, albeit in a typological fashion, in the story of Nebuchadnezzar's grass-eating period. And then he found it in an obscure interpretation of Ezekiel 39.9. Now he's okay, so I think he's incorrect here. Right. So- Miller never talks about the Jews being released on at the end of the 2520 because right. he's quite clear that they're no longer uh, God's people. Right. But he uses the type in type the Jews release from bondage. It, it's just typical of what's going to happen at the end of the world. But no way is he attaching a 2520 period for literal Israel. Okay. Right. So Miller never teaches the 2520 period for literal Israel in Leviticus 26. And what he doesn't do well is he doesn't really define how Leviticus 26 is fulfilled with literalism with by literal Israel, which we do, right? So we understand that it's fulfilled by literal Israel during the Babylonian period during that 220 years from 677 to 457. So, but Miller didn't really have the tools to figure some of that out that we have today. But um, so Miller never did what people say he's doing, and definitely what um, Eugene Pruitt is claiming Miller was teaching. But he's misrepresenting Miller's views, and and people do that when they don't have a good argument against it. They try to color things in such a way that it's going to create prejudice that people are going to say well that doesn't make sense and that doesn't make sense so he's not really presenting what Miller taught but he's also not presenting uh, what Jeff was teaching at the time right which I think is much more relevant it's not so much because Jeff isn't saying I think Miller was correct on every detail of his understanding of Leviticus 26 because he didn't recognize higher medicines right so he's going to talk here about Hiram Edson as well, uh, reinterpreting it. So, so he does know about Hiram Edson's view as well. So he does know some things, but he's not really pre- presenting them very fairly. He, he presents it in an unflattering way. Right. And one one of the things about this, when we're when we're considering what Father Miller had taught, when we're considering what James White taught, when we're considering what Uriah Smith presented. We need to be able to examine their points, but to examine it for ourselves using scripture and following Miller's rules. And if I have ever presented anybody's view in a a sort of a a weak manner, uh, I pray that people can forgive me, always believe that the best way to do to address somebody who's presenting error to show that it's error is to actually show it in its full uh, and true form because if I present it in a sort of uh, um, uh, you know I make it a little bit impotent uh, before I present it then if somebody who does believe it recognizes that, that I have not presented it correctly then that would give them reason to dismiss my objections to it. Uh, but also for those who may be interested in looking at it, if, if, I, if I present the weak argument, uh, especially if it's a straw man argument, uh, against something, then 
if they take the time to examine it and say, oh, he missed this point or he misrepresented it in some way, then that might give them occasion to accept that, don't not accept any of my arguments against it. They'll just pick out the fact that, you know, I didn't represent it correctly. I think it's really, really important in that sense. The other thing, of course, is if I can't understand it fully and I can't under the str understand the strengths of someone's argument, I have no reason to dismiss it. And I also may miss new light because I may assume that it's not correct. There actually may be light there um, that I can accept, even if some of their conclusions are wrong, because Satan always mixed, mixes truth with error. And often the two reasons is one is to make error more palatable, but the other is so that truth will be rejected, the people will throw out the baby with the bathwater. Right. So we have to be really careful about that. Okay. We are now a little bit over our time. We have several things to return to tomorrow, several points that we will be addressing. Do we have any other questions or comments or observations from what we've been addressing today? Shall we then close with prayer? Loving Father in heaven, we thank you for this time that we have been able to spend together where we can study more to understand that which you would have us to understand. As we look to go through this today, we ask, Father, for your guidance and for your direction. For those that are about to close their day or have closed their days, we ask that they are able to rest, be with us all, Guide us in that which you would have us to do. For may your will be done. Thank you. Help us to return again to our, our studies so that we may learn more about you. For this we thank you and this we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.